me start this review off by saying I've never played a single visual novel before in my life. Shocking, I know. The genre of visual novels never appealed to me before, and the general subject matters presented in the vast majority I've seen seemed weak to me. At a glance, most appear to fall into similar categories where you choose between which kawaii cat girl and or meathead lummox you want to date and eventually do the funky monkey with, while some mildly irrelevant plot plays in the background and everyone blushes all the time. Bonus points if they have magical powers, are wearing Japanese school uniforms, or have a needlessly tragic backstory. When I play a game, I want one of two things. Either take me on an adventure, or give me a story with characters I can connect with, and a world I'd rather live in to escape reality. Anywho, Echo is a free, Patreon-funded psychological horror visual novel featuring a cast of anthropomorphic characters that takes place in a dilapidated town of the same name somewhere in the southwest. What starts out as a simple reunion to catch up with old friends quickly goes south as otherworldly events start happening around town. I originally found Echo's Itch.io page via someone's retweet of another tweet of some person I didn't know that I saw secondhand from a like of someone I did follow. Just like most people, I'm sure. The vague title Echo and stylized screenshots intrigued me since it didn't fit the mental image I had of what visual novels were. It wasn't super anime and over-sexualized, almost as if it might have actual substance to it. After seeing the game was free, I installed the latest version on a whim and decided to give it a try. Given my jaded opinions and general disinterest in visual novels thus far, my bar for expectations was pretty low. I was ready for disappointment within the first five minutes. And here we are. I was converted into a fan of the story so quickly, I'd end up playing every character route, dialogue option, the prequel, joining the discard, and drawing fan art for the first time in years, all in under a month. Yes, I'm aware I draw STO fan art all the time. Don't at me. I had so little expectations going in, I was completely blindsided by how engaging the characters in the world would be. Over the course of playing the game and seeing everything it had to offer, I felt the need to mold all the opinions, praises, and critiques I've gathered into a review. Because one random nobody's opinions on the internet is obviously worth that much. So then, big fat warning to anyone who hasn't completed the game in all its roots yet, cause I'm gonna be spoiling the flippin' heck out of everything. And yes, I'm gonna be keeping this PG the whole time. Cause that goes sure as heck ain't. I'm gonna work my way through my first time experience with the game in the chronological order I played everything, and what thoughts I both had then and have gathered since. Please keep all hands, legs, and miscellaneous appendages inside the ride at all times. Thank you. Intro sequences for games these days, especially indie titles, are crucial for success. If you can't sell someone on the narrative of a story within the first 20 minutes, you failed as a game developer and likely won't retain much of an audience. That being said, I think the interesting take on Echo's intro is actually what got me hooked while I was still on the fence. Let's start with the characters we're introduced to first. We got Chase Hunter, an average American brown otter who's visiting his podunk hometown of Echo in the middle of hick nowhere for a school project and to catch up with old friends. We'll be playing as this water sausage for the majority of the game. It's not like he has any ulterior motives or a shady past he can't remember due to repressed memories and the town is haunted by otherworldly forces or anything. Wouldn't that be crazy? Bonus points if they have magical powers. We also got TJ Tobias Hess who is a precious polo wearing Canadian lynx who loves Jesus and has to be protected at all costs. Next we have Jenna, um, uh, Jen, Jenna, Jenna Marbles. Sure, why not? She's a Native American Finnick Fox who plays the sole female in a primarily male cast. It's honestly a bit unfortunate there aren't more characters like her in the game, in my opinion, because her level of femininity and sass are on point. The first 20 minutes or so are simply the three of them carpooling down the road to their old hometown. The whole scene is admittedly a bit dull, yet I quickly realize something interesting about the approach the game uses in its narrative. Various situations and to what extent they are expanded upon through the eyes of Chase have a striking impact on how relatable everything is. Basic situations tend to have enough intrigue to keep you interested in what's going on, yet are also mundane enough to feel like real life. I can't quite explain it, but it's something Echo does really well. A good example of this is how Chase will often pause and reflect on minor inconveniences or intrusive thoughts, something that everyone does subconsciously but is rarely used effectively in writing. Occasionally, these moments are used for humor but often expand on character development and continuation of the story. Adding this kind of narrative factor into the mix is a bold and dangerous move. If done wrong, it can derail an entire story and leave the reader confused and disinterested. Yet, Echo manages to pull it off without a hitch, adding to the believability and validity of the world as a whole. If you're a millennial and have any level of social anxiety, shyness, self-doubt, or just plain awkwardness and are still trying to figure out the meaning of life while technically being what's classified as an adult, this game is pretty much written about you. Not for you, about you. It's like life is strange all over again. For crying out loud, you're watching a cartoon fox talk to you through a pre-written script on the internet. I'm already socially awkward enough as it is. You don't need to call me out like that game. So then, what do I think about Chase as the main protagonist? I've seen a number of people say he's self-centered, has the emotional spectrum of a boulder, and his goatee and blue shirt are the entire depth of his personality. And, well, 
they're not entirely wrong. I'll admit he's not the most unique character in that his actions and reactions to situations are often cowardly and passive at best. He doesn't do a whole lot to make himself stand out in the group and is often the proverbial fly on the proverbial wall, like a really boring Mary Sue who's addicted to mineral water. All that being said, his lack of personality actually benefits the game and is what defines him as a good character, I think. You see, when you play Echo, you play as Chase. You make decisions on what he'll say and do, taking direct control of his actions at critical junctions throughout the story. You're not left simply watching things unfold like a Spanish soap opera, you're often participating in them instead. So then, our friendly neighborhood Otter Man is essentially a blank slate. Someone so barren of strong emotions and opinions, you can easily project yourself onto him. It's an ingenious way of storytelling and something Telltale titles often do. So while Chase himself has about the character depth of a deflating kiddie pool, he's exactly what he needs to be for the game to be as good as it is. If he were any more complex, defining traits of personality of his character would start forcing a narrative onto the player they may or may not agree with, leaving the game to have less of an emotional impact. Anyway, moving back to the story, after everyone arrives and gets settled at the Bates Motel, we meet the rest of the cast we'll be spending the remainder of the game with. We have Carl Hendricks, an overweight ram who's overbearing with an Oreo addiction. Yeah, let's go with that. Who is essentially the comic relief of the group. There's Flynn Moore, a lizard thing. I literally didn't know what he was for two thirds of the game. That likes to play the bully while making everyone feel uncomfortable with how much his shirt is unbuttoned. And lastly, we have Leo, the hulking Hispanic red wolf who's the self-proclaimed leader and protector of the group. The story continues on as everyone visits an amusement park the next day and we learn more about people bit by bit and how their history ties them together. That's when the game starts to get a bit more interesting and soon we're given our first dialogue option. The choice presented to us is meaningless and where Chase decides which of his two friends he likes more and has zero bearing on the rest of the game. I chose TJ by the way because he's adorably innocent. Although pointless in the long run, it's a nice precursor that makes the player aware that their choices might have consequences later on. A lot of talk and some battle of the sexes later, a big argument breaks out where Flynn accuses TJ of withholding information about one of their friends who drowned when they were all kids, or have a needlessly tragic backstory. Everyone splits off in different directions, and that's when we the player get to make the big decision that changes everything. How thirsty is Chase? Joking aside, this is the pivotal point in the game where things start to matter, and you choose which of the five different paths the game will go down. Like most branching story games, each individual route follows a similar timeline of events to begin with that grows more and more dire as the game progresses. There's a dark force that has a hold over the town of Echo, and feeds off death and guilt and... and death and... I don't know, it's kind of ambiguous to be honest. Last time I asked about it on Discord, it started a whole metaphysical debate I couldn't follow and people got in trouble. So let's just leave it at that before anyone yells at me. The story arcs for each character are different and unique enough that makes the game worth playing a minimum of five times just to see and learn everything there is to offer. So then, how did I start my first playthrough of the game, you ask? Well, according to the developers, I committed a cardinal sin by playing TJ's route first. Though I think a better question would be, who wouldn't play TJ's route first? Putting aside the fact that the Lynx is adorable, kind of like how you find a puppy adorable, it just made logical sense to, as a decent person to go after him instead of anyone else. Most people who play choose-your-own-story games generally tend to make morally right choices when presented with conflict. So, out of all the options presented to you, one of your most vulnerable friends just ran off after being bullied. I mean, seriously, a freaking course I'm going to follow him, who wouldn't? TJ's route is probably my favorite storyline in the game as a whole. I'll explain what I mean by that later. The primary reason being the arc is uneventful and peaceful compared to the others. That may sound boring, and at times it was, but even though Chase becomes more and more possessed near the end of the week, there's a noticeable lack of dread that escalates into the eventual mass hysteria that overtakes Echo. There's no deranged underground orgy parties and hidden bars, no serial killer methods, no ghostly wendigos trying to murder you, and no vengeful spirits keeping you hostage in purgatory. Instead, for the vast majority of TJ's route, you're just hanging out with a friend. It's clean and simple, and I like it. Most of the scenes in TJ's route consist of admittedly mundane scenarios, such as doing yard work you were guilted into by a non-overweight diner lady, going to the mall and playing skee-ball, and playing games of Never Have I Ever, because we all know those always end well in stories like these. What makes it all worthwhile though, and another reason TJ's route is my favorite, is seeing his character develop through the story's slow burn. Either through self-confidence or being influenced by whatever's an echo, TJ slowly overcomes his propensity of being an emotional crybaby and takes a stand for himself and becomes more brave. Sort of. It's not perfect, but it's notable progress made nonetheless. The second half of TJ's arc consists of a supposedly impromptu scavenger hunt when you uncover an old letter from the group's dead friend from when they were kids. Reading between the lines, it later turns out the whole thing was just a ploy planned by TJ to help him cope with his guilt over the incident. Tensions of course rise, however, as Chase discovers something's amiss, and we witness a messy de-evolution of his personality as he becomes increasingly overprotective of TJ to the point of crazed obsessiveness. Gee, that sounds familiar. Oh, and this guy named Julian is here too. He looks like the kind of millennial that drinks boba tea while wearing turtlenecks. 
Don't worry about him though, he's just a plot device. Don't get me wrong, I love the tension and action in the other routes, but the mundanity of TJ's story is what makes it special. I'm reminded of other games like Undertale where while there's an overarching plot and some action, you're generally more focused on just being friends with the NPCs instead. The same thing can be said for TJ's route, I think. In the end, TJ became my favorite character of the cast. Given the bashful and naive stereotype he falls under, you feel genuinely sorry for him when something bad happens. Not to mention, considering how often this game just casually drops ridiculous amounts of profanity, his lack of cussing is a refreshing relief. There is just one major bit of criticism I have for his route, however, and I hope is addressed somewhere down the line, and that's the ending. It's excellently written, but fails in one vital area, and that's connection to the reader. Remember how I said Chase's blank personality was great for vicarious storytelling? That's exactly the problem here. Midway through TJ's story, there aren't any meaningful choices anymore, which left me feeling disconnected as Chase grew less and less like himself. I felt powerless, like I was watching a tragedy unfold I had no part in. There was no option to fight back, taking away total control from the player. Given the game's ability to choose a path of the story to a limited degree, it felt… incomplete to me. I want to make myself clear on this. Chase is a lot of things. I don't love him like some people do, but I don't hate him either. He's a mix of mostly good intentions, but that doesn't mean he's a good person. One thing I never felt he was, however, was a cold-blooded killer. Yes, I hear you all screaming Sydney in unison, shut up! The murder of Flynn at the end of TJ's route shocked me more than anything, and not in a good way. It left me feeling hollow inside. I knew very little about Flynn's character at this point, but no matter how much of a bully he was, he didn't deserve to die for his sins. To put it bluntly, Flynn's death felt morbid and unnecessary, especially when you take into account the hallucination of a decaying corpse in the prologue. I get that that was the point, but still. Plus, I was left with a bitter taste in my mouth with the Bonnie and Clyde style getaway that Chase and TJ pull right after. Chase makes a comment that TJ is simply acting like they did when Sydney died, covering for another unintentional death of a friend, but that's not the impression I got. Intentional or not, TJ seemed despondent and emotionally barren to me at this point, like he had been broken too many times. Given how much I liked TJ's character and related to him personally in many ways, it felt like an inappropriate way to just dump his character. I get that Flynn's death and everything that happens in the end is supposed to have a deeper meaning or whatever, but I still hope TJ's arc sees more attention in the future, namely some other option where TJ isn't completely broken and Chase doesn't become a murderer. Well, okay, a double murderer. Sue me for wanting at least a somewhat happy ending. There's currently no The End splash screen for this route, which is a bit odd, so maybe that's a glimmer of hope there's more to come? I'm not going to presume to suggest anything to the writers, as that wouldn't be appropriate. But if nothing's done and TJ's route is indeed finished, I think it's a huge missed opportunity to make an awesome character arc even greater. Moving on, I was playing through the different arcs based on the order in which they were presented to me in the list initially, so Carl's story was next. I'll be honest, I didn't have very high expectations for Carl at the time and figured his arc would be rather boring. I typically don't care for stoner character types, mainly because they tend to be the butt of jokes, useless, and just plain annoying for the protagonist to babysit. Considering Carl was modestly high on Oreos for the first few days of the game, I didn't expect to be very into his character. Plus, it's like 100 degrees out, why the heck is he wearing a hoodie? But like most things in Echo, this game went and surprised me. I mean, just look at this picture. Look at that face! This is meme material, people. I ended up liking Carl a lot more than I thought I would. During the first day you hang out with him, you start to find out his character's got deeper-seated issues going on, and him and Chase have more history than is explained at the offset. What really sold me, though, is the general banter between them. The dialogue just feels genuine and how you would want a best friend to talk to you. It makes everything all more relatable when Carl finally spills the beans about his underlying depression and social anxiety, and how he's not really inspired or motivated by anything in life. I've known people who feel like that, and have been there myself, to be honest. It's something I think most people can relate to. Disinterest and apathy towards one life is a heavy subject to tackle. It's the kind of situation where you want to help, but fear if you say the wrong thing, even with good intentions, your words will do more harm than good. That said, I have to give the writers a lot of credit for handling the topic in a tactful and respectful way. Oh, and on an unrelated note, this line made me laugh. Emotions, video games, debauched birthday party, and one lazy-eyed husky later, spooky stuff starts happening finally. One trip through the crawl space to Narnia, and congratulations, we have officially entered purgatory. No, for real, the cast is now in literal purgatory from here till the end. To clarify, I realize this isn't actual purgatory, and despite what it seems like, there aren't any real ghosts in the story. There's a whole lot of disposition you gather from other routes about how the spirits are actually just twisted imitations of people's personalities that the thing inhabiting Echo is creating on demand. Essentially, imagine Pennywise from It and what he can do to the folks in Derry. But we're going to ignore that rabbit hole for now, because my joke about purgatory sounded funny in the script. For the longest time, I thought this section of the story was just a dream, which in hindsight, it kind of is. But after wandering the halls and the whole spooky kitchen scene lasted more than an hour, I realized the plot was going to be here a while. The majority of what happens to Chase for the remainder of the story past this point can be summed pretty much up as... Never bump your knee and think, well... 
this is it. I'm dead. So there's that. Admittedly, I think this whole scenario was the biggest drawback for me in Carl's route, sadly. This whole purgatory and pseudo-possession mystery lasts two-thirds of his arc. From an artistic and writing perspective, I could admire the effort that went into setting the scenes for a looping set of hallways that have no exit, reality-bending rooms, and a cabin in the woods that has literal nothing but Minecraft void around it. The writing subtleties for both Jenna and Carl, who are displaying disturbing levels of murder ghost tendencies, is also pretty good. The whole thing has its moments for sure, some of them seriously intense, but it all dragged on for way too long. And considering that this trope of a vague puzzle room that doesn't obey the laws of nature repeats itself three times before anything significant happens, it got old real fast. I know I'm glossing over some pretty noteworthy mystery plot points here, but there's a lot of Carl's arc that I had a hard time quantifying into words simply because it pulls too many reality-bending cards, which is difficult and confusing enough to portray in writing as it is. And while we're at it, one of my other gripes is the whole James and John situation. I get that the point of the mystery was, who's the murderer? Everyone points to John, but oh no, Jenna has a knife, and surprise, it was James the whole time. After seeing all the dialogue options, playing through both endings, and scouring Discord, I understand the plot twist. However, my complaint is a bit more basic than that. James and John are two very generic names that both begin with the letter J. During my initial playthrough, I had a hard time remembering who was who because of this. If it were like James and Franklin, or Maverick and John, or something along those lines where the names were a bit more unique, I don't think I would have been as confused. Granted, the similarity of their names may have been on purpose for that very reason, in which case that's a pretty 200 IQ play by the writers. But regardless, for the first time through, it seriously derailed me and made the reveal of James being the killer a lot less impactful than it probably should have been. Anyway, as the plot thickens, we slowly begin to realize Jenna and Carl are both being kind of half-possessed by incarnations of Jigsaw, because they both want to party dead and want to play games with them as well. Chase's ankle is broken for, like, the third or fourth time in a row by now, and Husky Boy is just loving life. It's always good to be positive when you're in hell. It's around this point we get to the arc's most crucial choice to let what's influencing Carl overtake him completely or tell him he should fight it. Essentially, this is the equivalent of the game hitting you in the face with a bat. Would you like the good ending or the bad ending? I can't imagine in what universe anyone would rightly think allowing a spirit of child murder or serial killer to puppeteer your body for the lulls would be a good thing. But hey, at least Carl says he feels more confident, so that probably makes up for the whole murder thing, right? As the mystery draws to its climax and Chase has to read scraps of newspaper to complete the final puzzle, Jenna Marbles loses it and goes full vine mode when she pulls a knife on the group like a champ. And let me see what you now that I think about it, so much of Carl's root is just pure meme material. I love it! It's then that I was given the chance to intervene in the ensuing fight to save Carl. Oh boy, a choice! I'm sure this is gonna go great! Being the perfectly logical person I am, I reasoned that if I were to grab Jenna, who is wielding a knife wildly, I'd be able to simply snag it from her and turn the tide. Because that's how knife fights work. Well, I made my choice. Time to get fully involved in this fight. Oh, look at that. I've been impaled. <laughs> yeah, I probably should have seen that coming given I was playing as Chase. So I finally managed to get the otter killed. Surely that won't ever happen again though, I'm smarter than that. Anyway, rewinding time, I chose the other option. You know, the one that doesn't get you killed. One more trip through purgatory for old time's sake and we find out the choice to tell Carl not to become a possessed serial killer was actually good advice. Who'd have thought? We find Carl's getting a better hold of his depression and social anxiety and it only took a literal trip through hell to do it. As sarcastic as I say that, it's actually a really nice scene to see his character become more confident and self-reliant as he realizes he's capable of being his own person. And on that note, it's also why Carl's good ending is my favorite ending of any of the routes, purely due to its simplicity and subtle message of empowerment. Chase hasn't hooked up with anyone, thank everything holy, and Carl's getting his life back together and going to school again. And best of all, everyone's alive. Perhaps emotionally scarred for life, but I'll take what I can get. The thing that takes the cake for me, however, is Chase and Carl are best friends again like when they were kids, and the game ends on a hopeful note that everyone will be alright. It's honestly the most upbeat ending of the whole game, and it was just a nice, wholesome way to end the story. Leo's arc was next for me on the list. Given his character's behavior up to this point, I had a feeling I knew where this route would go. Sure enough, the first half of Leo's route is pretty much what I expected, a meathead dating simulator with some minor flares of drama from outside sources. Everything seemed mostly par for the course for the first half, some areas dragging on a bit as stages were set for future events. I did find the mention of the holes Leo punched in the wall in his room, however, when he got angry at video games were rather humorous though. <clears throat> Not that I've ever done anything like that or anything. It wasn't until I had the opportunity of searching his browser history did the fuller picture of Leo begin to form. I have to give credit to the writers of this section, as there's a certain elegance to how it was described that gave the exact feeling of unease that was intended. 
The descriptions of Leo's Google searches were generic at first and a little comedic, but quickly turned unnervingly specific and stalkerish. When I had the option to search his phone text messages later on, it only reaffirmed everything I already thought. I didn't trust the wolf as far as I could throw him, though I have to admit that one-liner towards Clint in the diner was a dang good one. <laughs> You know, it's funny, really. Looking back, I have mixed feelings about Leo as a character, sort of like Chase, you could say. I like Leo and who he presents to be in theory, but as soon as you go more than skin deep, things get freaky real quick. There's a lot of layers going on with this guy that I don't really know how to digest. On one hand, he's kind, supportive, and protective of his friends. On the other hand, he's a self-centered, obsessive, manipulative stalker. And yet, even after everything that happens, after every awful thing he does, I'm still left feeling bad for him. You writers for this game deserve some credit, because y'all made me feel things for what would normally be classified as a bad guy in most scenarios. So putting the lummox aside, let's talk about the rest of Leo's route. I mentioned before TJ's route is my favorite, and as a whole, it still is. But I think the second half of Leo's arc is better, and honestly brings my rating of it pretty much to a tie with TJ's. As soon as Duke and Brian show up to the diner with a gun and murder Janice, the mundane soap opera up till this point spins a complete 180. Should be noted at this point, I think, that Janice already went full Hannibal Lecter mode on Julian in the kitchen, though, so, like I said, plot device. Everything that happens with Chase and Brian in the trailer right after is by far one of the most heart-pounding scenes I've ever witnessed in a game. I really can't praise Brian's writing enough in the scenes that followed. I was hanging on every word the serial killer Bear said, fearing stable mail might snap at any point. There was something especially profound about the way Brian described the reasons for having that mirror on the ceiling above where Chase is tied down during this sequence. At first mention, I just figured it was some dumb sex dungeon thing and didn't think much of it. It seemed like an appropriate fixture given Brian's perverted character, nothing more than background disposition. But as soon as he started describing why he had it, the concept I had in my head became so much more terrifying. I was squirming in my chair. I hadn't felt this uncomfortable with a video game since we met Eddie Gluskin, mind you. And that's saying something. There's just too much of Leo's route for me to talk about without dragging on for hours. Every scene that followed until the end had me on the edge of my seat. Duke holding Leo at gunpoint, the way the group tries to leave the car, but something pulls them back into an infinite loop like a Twilight Zone episode. How the creature inhabiting the town attacks the speeding car and yeets it into the lake. When Brian kidnaps Chase by force and drags him into the mine where he's killed numerous others in his delusions that he's protecting the town. The monster appearing in the mines in the terrifying way it's described. The fourth wall breaking inner monologue that Chase has that directs the player themselves to safety. Literally everything in the second half of Leo's arc is just a non-stop panic attack and I love it! Also, can we just take a second to appreciate Kudzu here? He's honestly my favorite side character of this story, second to my fellow Trekkie Daxton. I think what makes him so good is he's level-headed throughout everything that happens. He's not reckless or obsessive or unreasonable like the rest of the cast. Honestly, a lot of his personality reminded me of Lee from The Walking Dead. Not sure why, but I ain't complaining. Competent characters during a horror story are always a good thing to have in my book. On to the ending, though. Being the goody two-shoes I am in my ever-present quest to be nice to every NPC in a video game, I told Leo we'd lurk something out. After everything the cast had been through up to this point, I figured leaving him behind would likely get him killed. Or worse. Over the course of the story, I had gathered Leo was a lot of things. Manipulative and toxic to name a few. But, like Flynn, he didn't deserve to die. The moment Leo yanked Chase off the train was when I knew I got the otter killed again. It really goes to show how good the writing for this game is, you know? A few lines before anything actually happened, I immediately had a flashback to earlier like a cheesy soap opera with the camera ripple effect and accompanying harp strings to the mention of some guy Chase read about at the library who lost his legs when trying to hop a train during the last hysteria. I couldn't put my finger on it, but even back then I somehow knew. Oh yeah, this is totally foreshadowing something. The sequence that followed played out just like I thought it would. Now here's the thing, this scene is incredibly well written and really disturbing. I don't know if it's intentional or not, but the way the now legless Chase was treated by Leo reminded me of another niche horror game. In the game Welcome to the Game 2, there's a fictional villain called the Dollmaker. I won't go into details because this guy's backstory is seriously messed up, but let's just say there's a similar tone of amputation here with his victims. I couldn't help but see a parallel in the situation as Chase dies in Leo's arms like a toy. Like I said, I don't know if this was intentional reference or not, but regardless, it only added to the creep factor. So, using my powers to bend space and time to my whim, I loaded my save file so our otter wouldn't die a horrible, painful, dismemberment-related death. The scene that followed was pretty much what I expected as Leo chose to stay behind. However, the very next sequence as Chase watches the train leaving Echo, I have a hard time describing just how well it's put together. 
Occasionally in media, there are these special moments when visual storytelling, soundtrack, and the experience of pieces provided to the viewer all culminate into one brilliant instant. The writers of Echo hit that perfect crescendo when Chase's inner monologue splits into two separate entities, with him and the voice inside his head, before merging into one at the end. After the horrors each of the characters had endured and I myself experienced over the nights of playing Leo's route, the scene gave me chills. It's easily the most powerful and memorable sequence in the entire game, period. Leo's route proved to be exactly what I would want from a thriller horror story. A lot of drama and intense moments that know exactly when to relax just long enough for you to think that you're safe before pitching you into the fray again. The descriptions and dialogue were spot on throughout the story and gave an experience that's hard to forget. Then came time to play Flynn's route. I heard word of how edgy it supposedly was, so I had some expectations going in. You see, based on my experience with the other routes thus far, I had already guessed how this was going to play out. Chase would befriend the obscure lizard thing and get close enough to uncover why he was the way he was. We'd eventually discover Flynn's personality was really just a masquerade to cover his feelings and underneath that cold exterior was a gentle warm-hearted person you'd feel sorry for and want to help become a better person. So naturally the game decided to dropkick me into like Emma with Sydney for wanting anything remotely wholesome. I thought this was going to be a classic case of a bully being a jerk because he was sad or lonely or something like that. But nope. Like a lizard Tootsie Pop, when you peel away Flynn's bitter exterior, there's just more bitter underneath. Now, how I expected Flynn's route to go was similar to how the others played out. However, I quickly realized his story wasn't going to hold back any punches and take me on a not safe for TJ ride I wasn't prepared for. I thought I was going to get some nice slow character development during the first half of the week like all the others. Instead, I met with the truck scene on Tuesday. Freaking Tuesday! Ghosts haven't even hit the fan yet, and you're already throwing this at me not even 20 minutes in! I know this seems like an odd reaction, giving everything I should have known about Flynn so far, but let me explain. I pretty much experienced the different stories of Echo in honestly the worst possible sequence. Starting with TJ, I was presented with a Flynn who was just a typical bully obsessed with his childhood friend's murder. Then, during Carl and Leo's routes, he was pretty much missing in action and completely irrelevant until the last minute. I also wasn't a patron at the time and hadn't seen the side stories or played Route 65 yet, which was probably my biggest mistake. So, other than brief interactions, I didn't know squat about Flynn. Needless to say, the truck scene blindsided me harder than the creature ramming into Leo's car. <laughs> then, of course, a fair bit later comes the infamous smoke room scene and... <sighs> Oh boy, where do I begin with this? I originally saw the portrait of Chase approaching Flynn in the smoke room online, which intrigued me. It looked mysterious, like a nightclub or something. I honestly thought before playing, maybe Flynn's big secret was he was really just a party hard raver masking crippling depression. I had no idea what I was in for. When I was given the option to back out once the scene started getting more intense, I didn't hesitate to nope the heck out of there. Listen up though. Despite my criticism, Flynn's route is probably the most well-written of the arcs. The descriptions and dialogues are by far the most believable and the most visceral in the game. Leo's arcs may have been a thriller, TAJ's and Carl's routes may have been intriguing, but Flynn's route is grounded and solid. It hits a type of balance and believability, character development, and escalating drama that isn't present in the other routes. Besides, it has some of my favorite scenes and characters in the whole game. Second to Rocket Raccoon, of course, Daxton is one of my favorites. He seems a lot like the kind of nerd I'd probably be friends online with, given the games I play. Something really unique Flynn's Route does that no other arc has tried was shifting who you play as. Halfway through the story, Chase is locked in the back room of City Hall with countless Black Widows attacking him. A surefire way to cure him of his arachnophobia, I suppose. That, or turn him into furry Tobey Maguire, one of the two. Anyway, at this point, you take control of Flynn, hearing his thoughts and actions like you've done with Chase for so long. It took me a while to catch on at first, but it's a unique, jarring shift in gameplay that's really executed well. Also, it was nice to see Chase on screen as an NPC for a change. It was a different perspective to be sure, and his sprite looks a little outdated compared to the others, but I really liked the turn the route took. During one of my subsequent playthroughs later, scouring for things I missed, I must have chosen a specific series of dialogue options as I wasn't paying attention, and I got a glimpse of Shadow Chase standing there between TJ and Carl on the screen, and HOLY CRUD I NEARLY FELL OUT OF MY CHAIR! That thing caught me so off guard, even if it was only for a split second. So McSkinny, if you're watching this, good job. The car escape scene near the end was similar to Leo's arc, but with a few twists until the group splits off after being yeeted into the lake again. There's presently only one ending to Flynn's route, sort of like TJ's arc, and 
I'll be honest, I'm not entirely sure how I feel about it. Mainly because I'm not sure what the heck actually happened. Out of nowhere, the thing inhabiting Echo decides to go full Inception mode on Flynn specifically and reality starts to break away bit by bit. I gotta give Skinny credit for where it's due though, as unlike Carl's route, this was actually a lot easier to follow. We're ultimately presented with a surreal reunion between Flynn and someone he's missed for quite a while, and given some cryptic answers to how the whole hysteria possession thing works. I'm not gonna say who it is, even though context clues at this point should make it obvious, simply because it's possibly the biggest spoiler in the entire game. So if you want to find out, go play it for yourself. In the end, Flynn still can't catch a break. I feel... odd about it? Not like I did with TJ's end, though, despite Flynn meeting a similar fate. A part of me wants another option for a different ending, but I think the whole Inception twist left me a little too confuddled to actually feel any sort of emptiness on that front. Another part of me wants to say how it ended was borderline poetic, actually. Which I guess is a good thing, I think? Honestly, I'm not sure. In the end, Flynn wasn't my favorite character, if I'm being honest. I don't mean that he's not well written, mind you. In fact, like his route, he's probably the most consistent character of the whole cast. And after finding out the game has been co-written by like five people or something over its lifetime, that's saying a lot. He's the kind of goodish bad guy you love to hate and have a low-key hope for, if that makes sense. While there are definitely some points, who am I kidding, a lot of points in his arc I'm not a fan of and are downright unsettling to experience, the reveal at the end and ultimate climax and crescendo I think is worth the wait. Anyway, I ended up playing Jenna's route last of the bunch. Note to McSkinny in particular, it wasn't because I didn't want to play her arc or wasn't interested. Honestly, I was looking forward to her story more than I was Leo's. The problem was, I couldn't figure out how to actually start her route. I know, that sounds dumb, but I must have misclicked the first time or something when given the option to follow Jenna or Leo, because I thought I picked her option when I must have selected Leo's by mistake. So that really confused me, and made me wonder if her route was hidden somewhere in the choice of another character's story, or if it even existed at all. I know I was oblivious in hindsight, but I think it would help a lot if this choice was reworked so that Jenna was a standalone option among the group of friends at the lake and not a sub-selection of Leo's arc. It wouldn't have to be any different whatsoever, you could keep all the same dialogue, but the option alone would make it a lot clearer, I think. I was actually really interested to learn more about Jenna, considering my interactions with her and Carl's route pretty much consisted of her role-playing as a possessed vegetable with a knife, I didn't know a lot about her. What I had learned was she was the quintessential female archetype we see in media these days. Strong, independent, and doesn't take no sass from nobody. I love it when her type of character is played just right, and the writers did just that. Anyway, I was kind of surprised to see the first few days of Jenna's arc practically mirrored TJ's, just with Jenna involved this time. I'm not complaining though, I'm perfectly okay with this. What was neat though is we got to interact with her a lot more and learn how she ticks. Keep in mind I hadn't played Route 65 yet at this point, the game's prequel, so the hints at her backstory and the situation with her family, if you would call it that, made for intriguing dialogue with a lot to build on. Despite being outnumbered by the boys in the group 5 to 1, it was a nice change of pace to see her quips and sharp wit, along with her take charge attitude, which made her a seamless addition to the party. I read somewhere that each character's arc is supposedly based around different types of horror movies. In retrospect, that makes a lot of sense actually. TJ's route was based off a scary mystery, Carl's was a possession story, Leo's a slasher thriller film, and Flynn's a gore body horror, I think. Jenna, however, I read was going to be based off a monster movie. The moment I heard that sealed the deal for me. I'm not sure if what I just said is a fact or just a theory anymore, but screw it, I don't care. Given the sparse and terrifying altercations we'd had with that thing that inhabits Echo, I was pumped to play Jenna's arc. And you know what? I don't really have anything else to add at this point, because Jenna's route is nowhere near being finished. I don't think I even made it to Thursday before I got to the To Be Continued screen and the game chucked me back to the main menu. Although I just want to say, that moment where Chase saw a rock that he thought was a face, but then turned out just to be a rock so he laughed it off, then turned back and it really was a face and it was gone gave me chills. Jenna is the only character in the main group that has a level head throughout the story. So other than that, I don't really have anything else to say about Jenna's route just yet. I was only about 40 minutes in and how much hype I had built up, I was super disappointed to find out it was still such an early work in progress. Still, I think Jenna's arc has the potential to outshine the others in terms of scares and thrills exponentially if what we've seen so far is anything to go on. So I'm expecting great things from her route to come. So that being said, skinny don't screw it up. So that pretty much sums up my first time experience playing Echo. Obviously, it took me a minute to finish every route and dialogue option the game has to offer. I'm sure I've probably missed a few things along the way, but now that I've summed up my thoughts from my first time experience, I'm going to include some more miscellaneous thoughts and opinions that span Echo as a whole and not just specific story beats. Something I'd love to see in general is more dialogue choices throughout the game. When I say this, I don't mean that there should be more branches and endings to the game though. 
I can only imagine what kind of a tangled nightmare it is to keep track of all the branches already. This harkens back to my comments about how Chase's personality allows the player to project onto him. One of my favorite moments in Flynn's arc in this regard is when you're eating at the diner with him near the beginning. The not-overweight Janice asks what you'd like to drink and eat, and what side order you'll have. After experimenting with a few of the options, I made a resounding discovery. None of it mattered. At all. Whether you decide to copy Flynn's order play-by-play -play or go completely opposite, the subsequent dialogue that follows continues regardless. Now, the concept of meaningless choices like this may seem trivial, but I think it really helps shape the characters and drive connections to the world. While those options at the diner had no bearing on the story, I as a player felt like I needed to weigh my options and choose carefully. More dialogue options that determine how Chase responds to situations or characters he's speaking to, and then have no further influence on the plot, save maybe a sentence or two, would go a long way, I think. Oh, and while we're on the topic of game design in general, if the game ever does get a revamp, I'd love to see them move away from the current 4x3 window ratio. I get that Echo was probably designed to be played in a window mode originally, but it seems a bit odd now given most games these days are the standard 16x9 format. Especially considering the more current projects the Echo team is working on are in 1080p 16x9 already. Also, I'm kinda shocked to see there isn't any sort of merchandising for Echo. Even Adastra has their own card game deal with some other patron I forget the name of. I mean, I imagine it'd be pretty simple, really. T-shirts, keychains, mousepad, etc. Just merch in general with a logo even would work. Strike a few deals with some artists or fan artists, and boom, you could sell posters too. Wink. I don't know if the writers have considered merch deals at any time before, but if they haven't, they really should. Let's talk about sound design for a sec. Sound design is immensely important in games. I want to praise Echo for its original soundtrack. It's clear a lot of work and effort went into it. However, at the same time, I feel I can't give the game's sound design in general as much praise as I would like. It's a bit weird because the best way I can describe Echo's sound design is inconsistent. Like, the music itself is astounding. My gripe airs more on the side of the sound effects instead, and how they're rather generic and recycle a lot. For example, whenever a character gets hit with an item or is punched during a fight, it's the same sound as when Chase trips and breaks his ankle for the hundredth time. Or when Carl falls from the tree in his backyard. Or when Leo trips on the curb. To put it simply, it's an immersion-breaking thing. Also, can I just say, I don't know if any of the developers have ever actually fired a gun before. <clears throat> not that I have either, granted. But this is not what a close-up gunshot sounds like. That being said, this... That's a gunshot. Figure Stick would have the only working gun in Echo. Overall, I'd give my initial impression of Echo a solid 8 out of 10. Sure, there are a few bugs here and there, like a few typos and a few continuity issues, but nothing so drastic that I would consider worthy of mentioning specifically. I did dock a star for TJ's route, though. I want the links to have a happy ending, dang it! In all seriousness, though, Echo is one of the best indie title stories I've seen in years. It's a solid psychological horror game with relatable characters and a rich Stephen King-inspired world. If you're into that kind of storytelling and have the stomach for some of the more intense scenes the game has to offer, then I'd recommend checking it out. A link to Echo's Patreon page will be in the description below where you can download the latest public version of the game for free and support the developers too. I keep this channel mainly for my speed art videos, so I realize this full-length review probably came out of left field for all 16 people who are subscribed to me. I kind of doubt I'll be doing more reviews like this, because this took a buttload of time to make. So with all that being said, thanks to those who watched to this point. I hope you enjoyed this random review video, and until next time.